All right, well, praise the Lord. We're back in the book of Numbers. If you could go ahead and turn to chapter 14. If you recall, uh, as we've been going through the book of Numbers, the tragedy of unbelief, how the children of Israel have been uh, promised a wonderful land uh, flowing with milk and honey, and they are now making their way toward that land, but uh, something's gone horribly wrong as they've begun to uh, falter. They've begun to doubt that God can carry through on his promises. They begin to doubt who God has put in charge as the leader. They begin to think about the old uh, food that they used to eat down in Egypt and and begin to long for that uh, lifestyle of Egypt again, thinking with the uh, rose-colored glasses how wonderful it was down there when we were in slavery. And, um, And so they have really messed up. Last week we looked at it. Uh, they got up to Kadesh Barnea there and God said he allowed them to send spies into the land as we looked at. It wasn't God's desire really that they send spies in. He allowed them to do it and said, go ahead and do it. But he wanted them just to believe in him that the land was good and that it was filled with milk and honey and that was a great land for them. But of course they doubted that. The spies went in there and 40 days later they come back and, and we receive the evil report of the spies last week. And that report was, yes, it is a land flowing with milk and honey. Yes, it is a wonderful land. That part is true, but it's also a land that devours its inhabitants. It's a land that is filled with giants. And we went in there and we were like grasshoppers in their sight. And there's no way we're going in there. And 10 of them gave that evil report, but two of them came back Uh, Caleb and Joshua, and they said, no, it's a great land and the Lord's with us. Let's take it. But the evil report won out. And now as we begin the 14th chapter of Numbers, we find the children of Israel crying and weeping and and sobbing about uh, this land that God has brought us to. Uh, Let's go back to Egypt. They're going to start saying, and uh, you know, they, they start accusing God of some very, uh, wrong things. They start accusing God of, of just wanting to bring us out here into the desert to kill us and bringing us out here so that our children and our wives will become victims and really challenging the very nature of who God is. God is loving. God is forgiving. God is good. He's gracious. But now they are beginning to challenge God at his very nature. And, uh, and so tonight I've entitled the message against his nature. And we're going to look at the very nature of God tonight, who he is, a characteristic about him that is, is just wonderful. And, um, you know, he desires good things for all of us. And so if you could follow along with me, uh, we'll just read a little bit here. Verse one, chapter 14. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, if, we, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly, the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of uh, that guy, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. And I'm going to stop right there because I just want to talk about what we've looked at so far a little bit here. They lift up their voices. They start crying and weeping. Man, if we just only stayed in Egypt, we wouldn't have, we, we could have just died there happy in the way that we were. Or, or if we just died back there over there at Mount Sinai. Now here we are, we're in front of this land filled with giants and we're going to die by the sword and our women and our children are going to be victims. And so they're really just laying it on thick here and accusing God of being this maniacal uh, beast that would would drag these people out into the wilderness and and allow them to to die this horrible death. Really just challenging the goodness of God and and the graciousness of God. And so God is going to react to this here. But I was thinking uh, earlier this week, Ew, isn't that gross? 
Some of you might not know, I, I work down here at the mall, and uh, part of my duties in the morning, on some mornings of the week, is I, I clean the parking lot. And I've really come to hate cigarette butts. I've, I've come to hate them. And so I equate them to sin on occasion. As I go out every morning and I, and I start sweeping the curbs and just cleaning up the, the cigarette butts that are everywhere, I mean hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. It seems like more cigarette butts than what people come to the mall every day are out in the parking lot everywhere. And it's just a really disgusting thing. And I begin to just think about how, uh, you know, every morning they're there. I'll clean them up and, and, and the whole parking lot is clean. And there are other guys that have worked here at the mall and still work here at the mall who know what I'm talking about. And, and every morning you go back out there and they're all there again. All those cigarette butts, where did they come from? They're back again. And I, th- I was thinking about that in relationship to our sin. You know, it must be like that for God. We ask him to forgive us of our sins one day, and then the very next day, he, he, we're right back at that spot where we have all this filthiness in our lives, and, and God is gracious to come and to sweep all that stuff up and to just sweep it away. And, and man, wouldn't it be a drag if he didn't? Wouldn't it be a drag if he... If he decided one day, that's it. I'm not going to sweep, sweep up those sins any longer. I'm not going to sweep them away. I'm not going to cover them. You're just going to have to deal with them. But it is part of God's very nature to be gracious to us, to be merciful, to be forgiving, and to, to sweep that stuff away when we ask him to. If we don't ask him to, they'll, they'll remain. But we need to be uh, coming to him. And so tonight we're going to see another intercession by Moses. The, the children are in sin once again. The children of Israel are in sin. And Moses, once again, will have to come before the Lord and intercede and cry out to the Lord and ask the Lord to pardon those sins once again. You know, uh, we're in this pattern now of seeing the children of Israel uh, do well, be faithful, go out, and then when adversity comes or they just have a, a failing in their faith, then they draw back. And they begin to sin against the Lord once again. And then Moses has to come once again and, and offer that intercession and to pray for their sins to be covered once more. And so that's kind of a pattern we're going to see here tonight. But as we begin, again, looking at the, the nature of God, you remember as we were back in Exodus, um, when Moses had been given the, the tablets of the law, the Ten Commandments on the Mount Sinai, the Lord gave him those. And, and you remember that as he was handing the tablets over to Moses, he said, hey, you better get down there. They're worshiping a golden calf. And, uh, and so Moses goes down the mountain. And sure enough, he finds all the children of Israel down there worshiping a golden calf. And he throws the Ten Commandments down and breaks them. And then the Lord calls him back up onto the mountain again and he makes a new set of the Ten Commandments and he hands them over to Moses and then he comes and he greets Moses. He comes to Moses and he says these words to him. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. I'm gracious, Moses. Here's the second set of the law. I'm gracious. I will forgive. I'll, I'll, I'll overlook that iniquity. I'll forgive those transgressions. I'll forgive that sin. I'm gracious. That's, that's my nature. That's my very nature. And so Moses, his response to that is he falls down and he begins to worship the Lord. And then he says back to the Lord, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your inheritance. We are a stiff-necked people. We are a sinful people, but please pardon these sins. Pardon these sins and keep us as your inheritance. Don't cast us off. And so Moses had from the beginning an understanding of what God's nature was. As God reveals himself more and more to Moses, he tells them, tells him, that I am merciful and I, I do want to forgive your sins. And so as we look at the passage we're looking at right here, there's going to be one more plea to the people. Before you do this great sin, 
before you reject God and reject his plan, before you wholeheartedly turn against what God has asked you to do, uh, J- Jacob, or I'm sorry, uh, Joshua and Caleb, one last time, are going to make another plea. Don't do this. Don't do this. This is your last chance. And they begin to say to them, they tear their clothes, very passionate way of communicating uh, just a, an emotional state that they're in, tearing of the clothes, just grieved to the very core. And they spoke to the congregation, verse 7, of the children of Israel, saying, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. For they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. One last plea. Before you do this, before you make your decision here and and reject what God is calling you to do, One last time, God's with us. He's not with them. Their protection is gone. God has delivered them into our hands. They are our bread. Don't rebel against the Lord. Please do not do this great sin. God has given us this land. It's flowing with milk and honey. Let's take it. Let's go in. Let's be obedient. One last plea. But what is their answer? Verse 10. And the congregation said to stone them with stones. Kill them. We don't want to hear that. No, we reject that. Out, 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 of, out of hand. Stone them. Kill them. We don't want to hear that voice that is, is the voice coming from the Lord. We don't want to hear that. We're rejecting that. And so they've made their decision. They've made a decision that will cost them their very lives, that will cost them not only uh, a longer life, a prolonged life living in a land that is blessed and, and a, a land of, of blessing in, to their lives, but they've also shortened their lives. And they've really, um, you know, just rejected God and his promises and they're going to suffer for it greatly as they are consumed in the wilderness for the next 40 years. And so it says, Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. So God's going to come now after this decision has been made. It says in verse 11, Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me, and how long will they not believe me? With all the signs which I have performed among them, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. Now, does that sound like a gracious and merciful, long-suffering, forgiving God? It sounds a bit vengeful, doesn't it? It sounds like, whoa, wait a minute. Weren't you going to forgive us of all of our sins and, and, and have mercy on us and be gracious to us? God's like, they're out of there. That's it. How long will they do this? But we get a, a, a fuller idea. God is, is wanting to show Moses who he is and more about his nature, wanting Moses to intercede for those people. And so he's bringing Moses to this place where, where he wants him to be. And so Moses, in verse 13, goes on there and begins to intercede for the people. And Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it. For by your might, you brought these people up from among them and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land and they, will he- they have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face and your cloud stands above them and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land, which he swore to give to them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. This is Moses' prayer. He's, he's coming to the Lord with a bit of logic. Lord, don't do this. If you do this, all, everybody will know that 
it was a failed experiment of sorts is kind of what he's saying. But what he's really doing is, is, is pointing out some very logical things here. He's telling the Lord, Lord, it's your honor. It's your reputation that's at stake. The fame of you has gone out for all over the earth here in this area. And, and that's going to be at stake. He also tells him that, you know, your faithfulness to keep that covenant. Remember, you swore to them a covenant that you made with them. Now everybody will know that you're a covenant breaker. He's bringing this to the Lord. He goes on at your power and your ability to succeed in what you set out to do. It says, you know, you were not able to bring this people into the land. You were not able to do what you had wanted to do, your will to do. You weren't able to do it. He, uh, he kind of talks about the unfulfilled promises. Again, you swore these promises. You made many promises. This land has been promised to these people for over 400 years. And everybody knows that. And here, here we are coming up here and, and people are going to know that you were unable to fulfill that promise that you made. And the unrighteous actions. You couldn't fulfill it, so you brought them out here to kill them. And everybody's going to know that. Lord, surely this isn't what you want to do. He's reasoning with the Lord. And of course the Lord knows all these things. Of course the Lord knows all these things, but he wants Moses to understand them as well. He wants Moses to understand about his nature and understand that he wants him to intercede for them. Also, and this I think is is the main thing that I wanted to bring out tonight, it's against his very nature. Again, we've looked at what is his nature. His nature is to be long-suffering, to be full of mercy, and to want to forgive when a cry of repentance is made. It's against God's nature to do these things. And Moses is understanding that. And he's crying out to the Lord. Now, it's interesting there, in verse 17, Moses repeats back to the Lord exactly, almost verbatim, what the Lord had told him back in Exodus 34 that we looked at a few minutes ago. In verse 17, Moses says, And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken. This is real power. This is the real power right here. The power to be long-suffering. The power to forgive. The power to have mercy. It's easy to be uh, overpowering and and show a a show of force when you're able to. But to let things go, to to forgive, is, is what it takes real power to do that. So in verse 18, Moses again reminds him, Lord, you have spoken. You spoke and said, the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Lord, remember, you're long-suffering. Remember what you said. You're, you're long-suffering. You're, you're full of mercy. You're abundant in mercy. You're forgiving. Remember, Lord. Remember that you said this. He's reminding the Lord of this. And so, looking here, God will forgive iniquity. God will forgive transgressions, but... You see that but there? He will by no means clear the guilty. Who are the guilty? Those who are unwilling to bend their knee and ask for that forgiveness. Those who are unwilling to confess that they have committed those sins, that they have transgressed God's laws, that they have broken faith with him and and been unfaithful to him, unfaithful to his laws and his statutes. He won't clear them. They will not be cleared. They will not have their sins covered. They will not have their sins washed away if they're unwilling to admit that they have sinned against him. But Moses says, pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy. We're asking, Lord, forgive, pardon. Once again, wash away those cigarette butts. Sweep them away. Lord, we need your mercy one more time. One more time, Lord, forgive. 
pardon. And you know, I, in my life, I, I don't know if you feel this way, but in my life, you know, that is my, uh, the, the quality, the characteristic, the nature of God that, that fills me with the most, um, I don't know, love for, for the Lord, I guess, is, is that faithfulness, that, that characteristic of God just being faithful to forgive, faithful to, to wash it away. Faithful to blank the slate one more time. His faithfulness to, to be there to, to be merciful to my own personal sins and my transgressions and my shortcomings. God's faithfulness. It's awesome. It is awesome. And so, why did God do this? Why did God say these things? Why, does he, you know, why is he saying here, um, I'm going to strike them with pestilence. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to give you another people and they'll be better. They'll be mightier than these. Well, again, I've already kind of stated it. I kind of went ahead, but God's desire was that Moses would understand his nature and his heart for his people so that Moses would cry out to him and intercede on behalf of his people. Now, does that sound familiar to you? (laughs) Does it sound familiar? Well, of course, Jesus is our intercessor. And again, Moses is a type of Jesus. God told Moses, I'm going to send another prophet like you. He's going to be like you. Moses is a, a type of Jesus because he is there as a mediator between God and man to ask for the, the forgiveness of man's sins or to cover the, the, the sins of man, to stand between God's wrath and man's sin and, and have that taken out, have that taken away. And so we see there, this is a, a beautiful picture of Jesus in the Old Testament, the mediator. In Romans 8, 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is he who condemns. How are you going to bring something against God's elect? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Christ died, rose from the dead. He makes that intercession for us. He stands between us and, and God's wrath. The wages of sin, remember, is death, is, is God's wrath will come against the unrighteousness of men. And we need something to stand between us. We cannot stand before a holy and a righteous God in our flesh with our sins unforgiven. We cannot do it. We'll be wiped out. We just cannot do it. But Jesus, on our behalf, interceding for us, he went to the cross. His blood that was shed took away those sins. It didn't just cover those sins. It completely washed them away so that they don't exist anymore. We talked about it at the New Believers class uh, last Friday. Uh, you know, somebody asked, do we get judged for our sins as, as Christians? There's nothing to judge. When we stand before God, there's, there's nothing there to judge. They're washed away. They're, they're gone. We are judged for our works, the things that we do. We go before the judgment seat of Christ and we are judged for the things that we did after we came to him and what we did with the truth that we had and, and how we shared that truth and, and how we loved people and those sorts of things. And, uh, but there's no sin to judge. The sin is washed away. It's gone as far as the east is from the west. And so uh, continuing on there, in verse 20, the Lord's reply comes back. Lord, pardon these sins. Forgive us once again. Have mercy. And the Lord says in verse 20, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test these 10 times and have not heeded my voice, They certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. 
And so the Lord's reply is, it's already done. I have pardoned it. Not I will. Okay, yeah, let me, I'll get to that someday. I've already pardoned it. It's already pardoned. I've already taken care of it. As, as according to your word, it's already taken care of. And you know, that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing about the Lord. He just wants us to come and acknowledge. He wants us to come and ask. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The sins are already forgiven. We just need to come and acknowledge and, and just have him wipe us off and clean us up one more time. The sins are forgiven. He just wants us to ask. He wants us to acknowledge. Um, talks about them being put to, putting the Lord to the test ten times and not heeding my voice. Um, and so they're not going to see the land. And you say, well... I thought he was forgiving. I, I thought he would forgive that and, and just overlook it and, and it wouldn't be an issue. Why is he now saying they're not going to enter the land? Well, this is another aspect of, of this situation here. God's going to forgive the sins. The sins are forgiven. That's not the issue. But there's another aspect to it that, you know, we are going to reap what we sow. If we sow to the flesh, and I've, I've got a verse here. I'm just going to read the verse um, Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. You're not going to mock God. You're not going to sin and sin and keep on sinning and sow to the flesh your whole life and then go to God and say, forgive me of that. Okay, and then you go back to sinning and you're trashing God's grace. Oh, forgive me again. Okay, and then you go back. You know, God, God knows where our heart's at. God knows what kind of motivations we have. God knows if it's a, a true confession or we're just trying to wipe the slate clean so that we can go back and have a, a clear conscience for a little while. He knows when we're coming to him and how we're coming to him, what's the true motivation of our hearts, and he's not going to be mocked. You are not going to pull the wool over God's eyes. You are not going to be able to do it. There's just no way that any of us are going to pull the wool over his eyes. There's no way that we can do that. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And, you know, when we sow to the flesh in, the li- in our lives, you know, sometimes we have to pay for those things. And sometimes it's, it's something that it, it determines the rest of our lives. In the rest of that passage there, it says, He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Everlasting life. And so, you know, I could go into examples, you know, alcoholism, drugs, and, you know, just the things that we do in our lives to fulfill those desires and those lusts in our lives, uh, whether it be sexual or, you know, there's a lot of different things we could look at. You're going to reap what you sow in this life. And, you know, I don't think in this situation that God is saying, hey, this is an unpardonable sin. You guys are, uh, you know, the question is out there, though, does this mean that these people who have rejected going into the land, does it mean they're not saved? Does it mean in, in that uh, time frame, they would have gone into Abraham's bosom, right? Heaven is, is, a, is a stage later on, but in the meantime, until the Messiah comes, they're in Abraham's bosom waiting for the Messiah to come and to set them free from that. Uh, and so the question is, are they righteous and are they put in Abraham's bosom or are they put in the other side of that gulf in Hades? Are they, are they waiting in the other side over there uh, where the rich man was? Rich man and Lazarus uh, situation, that parable. And I want to err on the side of grace here and say that I, I think these people, and not across the board, I mean, we always have to look at an individual. Does the individual... Are they saved? I, you know, and we can't make those judgments because we don't know what, what all the situations were in their lives. But remember, they were saved when the Passover lamb was slain. Remember, they were delivered from Egypt because the Lord said, if you kill a lamb, which is a type of Christ being killed on the cross and his blood being shed, If you kill this lamb and and paint the blood above your doorposts of your house, you'll be saved. 
that death angel will pass over and you'll be saved. And so all these people did that or they wouldn't be here right now. And so I, I think that's a picture of the initial salvation and then going on from there, entering into God's rest, entering into his promised land is, is just entering into his perfect will for their lives. And, and I think we can say that this is not necessarily an unpardonable sin. Now, many of these people might have just been uh, completely unfaithful to the Lord. And, and maybe they didn't enter into Abraham's bosom when they finally died. But um, I think part of it is that maybe they were making God their savior and not their Lord. And many of us can do that as well. I've talked about it many times. Most of my adult life, Jesus was my savior. I believed that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I, I believed that wholeheartedly. I never doubted that. But he was certainly not the Lord of my life for the better part of 20 years, 15, 20 years, you know. Um, and so I, I think we can put it in those terms definitely for us here because as a Christian, we can do the same thing. We can be saved but we can wander around out in a desert wilderness experience being disobedient to what the Lord has for us, being disobedient to enter into the rest that he has for us, his perfect will for our lives, for the rest of our lives. You know, you can walk with the Lord uh, from a distance, at a distance, uh, for 30, 40, 50 years of your life, for the rest of your life. And you still might end up in heaven, but uh, again, the judgment seat of Christ. Everything that you did for the rest of your life is going to go up in smoke. It's going to be burned up as chaff and, and uh, wood, hay, and stubble. And so, you know, maybe no crowns is, is a situation. That's also a, a way we can look at it. But, um, you know, it, it is an individual thing, though. Did they truly believe? Uh, were they rebellious? You know, we don't have all that information. I think it's a way to look at it, though. Um, one thing that we just kind of jumped over, you know, there's a question out there. Are there generational curses? And uh, it's kind of a, a doctrine that's taught a lot in, in more Pentecostal circles. I do not believe that generational curses are a valid uh, biblical concept. I believe that you know, you can, from Scripture, I believe that you can see that a doctrine there, you know, reaping what you sow. Um, often, and we'll get into it here in a minute, it says, but your little ones, they're going to bear the brunt of your iniquities. Those poor kids that you brought out there into that wilderness, they're going to bear the brunt of what your disobedience, uh, disobedience has wrought, your unbelief. They're going to bear the brunt of that. And I think a lot of times is, is the case, you know, where, where somebody has uh, had a whole life of sin and, and, and their children end up reaping the whirlwind of that a lot of times, many times. Um, but generational curses, you know, um, go ahead and flip there to Ezekiel eighteen nineteen. I just want to hit on that passage really quick because I, I think that we can see that... Um, you know, the Lord holds each person accountable and that generational curses are, are probably not uh, a valid biblical doctrine. In verse 18, it says, As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, robbed his brother by violence, and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. And then in verse 19, it says, Yet you say, Why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right and has kept all my statutes and observed them, he shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the uh, righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But what? Uh, I'm sorry, but if a wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has committed, keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. And so 
there is, there's that verse and there's many other verses that you can look at to say that each person is held accountable for, you know, their righteousness before the Lord. And they're not going to be cursed because of something their father or uncle or, or somebody else did. Um, so it's a, weak, it's a weak doctrine, not any scripture to back it up, I don't think. Uh, I, I think it goes along with the kind of that Hollywood mentality um, and this is a, a verse that is used to point that out, is that the, the uh, iniquity of the fathers to the children to the third and fourth generation. But again, when you ask for the pardon for that iniquity, when you ask for the Lord to uh, forgive those sins, then everything is square. You're back to square one again. Now, there might be some reaping what was sown, but it's not necessarily a curse. And, it, and I think it goes along with... Hollywood kind of mentality of curses and, and that sort of thing. All right, so let's just uh, go ahead and, and read through the rest of this and we'll get wrapping it up here. So my servant, uh, verse 24, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land. I think that's a key verse right there. Caleb has a different spirit. Caleb has a spirit of, I'm following the Lord fully. I fully believe in what the Lord wants to do. I am fully sold out. He's my savior. He's my Lord. Let's go. Let's not rebel against what the Lord has for us. He has a different spirit than those who are just willing to, you know, just believe in the Lord just enough to get in the gate. You know, there's a different spirit there. He's fully uh, sold out for the Lord. He's a disciple. He's laid down his life. He's picked up that cross. He's willing to follow and go on with the Lord. And that's the kind of idea that, of course, we want to see in the New Testament economy. You know, being sold out for the Lord and being a a disciple of the Lord. A different spirit. And so the Lord tells him now in uh, verse 25, Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of <laughs> Jeff, Jephuni, I don't even know how to say that, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land, uh, which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones whom you said would be victims, I will bring in and they shall know the land which you have despised. And so with your own mouth, you have made the determination what's going to happen here. You said we're going to fall in this wilderness. We don't trust the Lord. He can't get us there. Our kids are going to be victims and we're going to be wiped out by the sword. So be it. If that's, if that's the position you want to take, that's what's going to happen. And, and it's, I, I think it's a you know, a valid point for us. You know, we can speak things into our lives and I'm not a name it, claim it, blab it, grab it kind of guy, but, you know, we can speak evil over our own lives and and just kind of uh, talk ourselves into a corner and, and that's kind of the position we fix ourselves into many times. Um, and so your children, they're going to be the ones that actually enter in. You're going to die in the wilderness. Verse 32, but as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days for each day you shall bear your guilt one year. Namely, 40 years. So for the next 40 years, you're going to be out there. Every day you had in the land, you could have been thinking about this. And and now for 40 years, you're going to be out there until your carcasses fall. Uh, And you shall make known, I'm sorry, you shall know my rejection. And so the Lord's going to make a, a pretty powerful point here. They're going to know that they rejected the Lord. 
those 40 years that they'll be there, they'll know for sure, man, we messed up. I, the Lord, verse 35, have spoken this. I will surely do to you all this evil. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness, they shall be consumed and there they shall die. Now the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report of the land, these very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua and Caleb remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. And so that's the, uh, the judgment of the Lord there. And now we see the reaction of the people. Verse 39, then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel and the people mourned greatly. No kidding. No kidding. Can you imagine just two years they've been out there. We're going to the promised land. We're going to the promised land. Here's all these dreams and visions of of just the greatness of what it's going to be like. And then they reject the Lord. And now the Lord is saying, you're not going in anymore. You're going to be stuck out there in the uh, wilderness. And so they're mourning greatly, of course. And they rose early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain saying, here we are, and we will go to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. (laughs) Now they get it. Now they get it, but it's too late. The Lord's already made the judgment. The Lord has already said, this is what's going to happen. And of course, this is a knee-jerk reaction. You know, the Lord wanted them to just be faithful. The Lord wanted them to go in of their own volition, but now only because the prospect of being out in the wilderness for the next 40 years and dying in that wilderness, you know, it's like that old saying, you know, uh, everybody in prison is sorry that they're there. Are they sorry they got caught or are they sorry for what they actually did to get there? You know, two, two big differences there. Two big differences there. These people are sorry because of the punishment that's going to come down on them. And now they're willing to do whatever it takes, but the Lord has already said, nope, that's it. And so Moses 41 says, uh, now why do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up lest you be defeated by your enemies for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you and you shall fall by the sword because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. But they presume to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. And so... That's the end of the chapter there, and we'll stop there, but it's interesting, you know. uh, They wanted to go and do it anyway, but Moses said, no, it's too late. The Lord's not with you on this. You missed your chance, and and now you're going to be stuck out there. But they went anyway, and uh, they suffered the consequences for it. And so again, you know, I just want to encourage you guys one last time. uh, Obedience, so important. So important that we are obedient to God's word, to what he has for us. He has so many promises in his word. Uh, Do you want to be a Christian that goes through your life uh, constantly in this back and forth? Okay, I'm, I'm walking with the Lord. Now I'm out in the wilderness. I'm walking with the Lord. Now I'm out in the wilderness. Do you want to have that kind of relationship with the Lord? Or do you want to be like Caleb, sold out? Do you want to have a different spirit? And and I think that's an interesting way of putting it because we know that what makes us able to walk with the Lord with a spirit like that is his Holy Spirit. When we are filled with his Holy Spirit, he will give us that desire. He will change our nature so that we have that desire to walk with him, so that we have the power to be a witness for him. That, my friends, is the what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you see it, you hear it talked about a lot, you know, well, you don't have the Holy Spirit because you don't speak in tongues. You know, that's a valid gift that that God gives. I, I believe that the gift of tongues is a valid gift for today. 
But the true evidence that you are baptized in the Holy Spirit is what happens to you when you walk out that door, not what happens when you're in here. We can have a bunch of uh, experiences in here, but if you walk out that door and you're not able to be a witness for him, you're not able to walk with him in a way that is sold out for him and in a way that uh, draws other people to, to wonder what's going on in your life and, and to just not be in that desert experience to have, you know, just a closer relationship with him, being abiding in him and he abiding in you, being able to uh, keep his word, to do his word. All of that comes through the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And you say, well, how do I get that? Well, just ask him. I've, I've come to believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it comes in, in different at different times in different people's lives for, for a very important reason. Because I don't believe that God is going to waste that filling of his spirit on somebody who says, I don't really want to walk, do that. I don't really want to be sold out for the Lord right now. And, and people come and they say, man, I want that experience. I want that experience. You know, pray for me to get baptized with the Holy Spirit. But there's really no desire there to live for the Lord. There's no desire there to be a Caleb to be a Joshua. It's just, I want an experience. I, I want to feel and, and do what I see everybody else doing here. But the person who finally comes to that place is saying, man, I want to I wanna live for the Lord with everything I've got. I want to walk with him. I want to live for him. Give me that power, Lord. I believe that is the time that the Lord says, okay, now, you, now I'll give it to you. I, I really believe that. It may be accompanied with a goosebump type of experience. It may be accompanied with a flash of light. It may not. It may just be, man, from that point on in my life, I just had a sense I wanted to walk with the Lord. I wanted to just live for him and serve him and get involved in church and, and you know, just be involved in, in, in the work of the Lord. It might come with the gift of tongues. It might come with other gifts. You might just have more love in your heart for people. But it comes when, when, you, when the Lord knows that you are ready to walk with him and w- live for him with your whole heart. And so let's just uh, pray that here tonight as we close. Father, I just pray for each person in this room right now, Lord, that, that they would want to go from having you be their savior to having them having you be their Lord, Father. And tonight, I, I pray that each person here would just hunger for that, would hunger and thirst for your righteousness, Lord, hunger and thirst for a closer, a deeper, more meaningful walk with you. Father, if they're not filled with your Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that they would cry out for it tonight. Lord, that you would empower them to be a witness for you, empower them to uh, be able to walk with you, Lord, and to allow you to sanctify them and set them apart to do the work that you have for them in their lives. I pray this for myself as well, Father. I pray that uh, this body of believers here, Lord, would just be on fire for you. Lord, that we would all become Joshua's and Caleb's.